every so often you'll come across a company trying to design a modular laptop. And besides the very, very few that come from established brands, they all fall flat on their face because one, they're going to have some sort of production issues because they're being way too ambitious, effectively trying to redesign the entire laptop industry, or in a lot of cases, they're straight up scams. But today we're looking at something that's actually a real product, that's actually having pre-production units being sent out, as well as having its first batch of production units being sent out as well. Today we're looking at the Framework Laptop. And before we get into the good stuff, I just want to say that this website is horribly designed. I can barely read some of this text. Why is there white text on a really light background? Why do I have to scroll all the way down your page just to see basically a line of text? Modern web designers, just please stop doing this. Ignoring that though, how is this modular? Well, you've already got sort of a rough idea from this picture here, but most modern laptops have everything soldered onto the board. They're going to have the hard drive soldered in, even the RAM in a lot of cases, the webcam, the fingerprint reader, literally anything that can be soldered together to make it so that you can't replace it is going to be soldered together on a modern laptop. In the case of the Framework laptop, they're making it so everything in the laptop can be replaced. Not just things like, hey, you can replace the RAM and the storage. That's pretty normal. On like reasonably decent companies, you can still do that. They're making it so everything in the laptop can be replaced. You can replace the battery, the webcam, the fingerprint reader, speaker, fans, keyboard, motherboard, anything you can think of is going to be replaceable. Now that's all well and good and really, really helpful for repair shops, but the problem with laptops in general is getting your hands on parts. While you can get things like, say, a new Wi-Fi chip or get new RAM or new storage, getting things like the motherboard you need or the fans you need in that system is incredibly difficult. Now, Framework has a very simple solution for this. We already have parts. Why don't we just sell them to you? And that's what they're going to be doing with their marketplace. So everything you need to go and construct this laptop yourself is just going to be for sale. And you can rebuild the laptop completely from scratch if you want to. And then to help out with the repair process, every single part is going to be marked with a QR code. Now, this QR code links to, and I quote, unprecedented access to documentation, repair guides, replacement and upgrade parts, and insight into design and manufacturing data. Now, I have no idea what this documentation is actually going to look like. I don't know if it's going to be any good, but what it is, is more than the zero documentation you get from the existing industry. Also, all of the parts in the device are going to be labeled. So things like, say, the memory or the storage or the battery or the speaker. If you're not 100% sure where those things actually go, you can look at where they're currently located so you know where the replacement is supposed to be. Over on the forum, someone was asking about board schematics. So if you wanted to go and do your own electronics repair, rather than just straight up going and buying a replacement part, you would have at least some chance to be able to. Now... They have said they are thinking about releasing board schematics, but they probably won't be available at the time of launch. I can totally understand why even a company that is this open to repair is still apprehensive to doing so, because by releasing board schematics, it does make it so that a competitor can completely reverse engineer your device without having to even do any work themselves. So... While electronics repair would be helpful, and I would expect them in the future to go and do so, I don't know if they're going to do it until maybe like a second generation. If that's how they want to do it, I can fully understand that. But if the device was just this, I think it would already be compelling enough for someone who really, really cares about right to repair and wants to vote with their wallet. This is already everything you could ever want from the right to repair movement. Now, this is where they try to make themselves stand out a bit because in all honesty, companies like HP and Dell and Lenovo, if they really wanted to, they could start doing this tomorrow. What this company is also doing is expansion cards. Now, the way the ports are set up in this device is very, very strange. So we have a headphone microphone combo jack because as the devs say, we care about headphones, which is honestly the state the industry should be in. And also four ports for the expansion cards. Now, I'll get into what these ports are in just a moment. The primary usage for these ports is deciding what ports you actually want on the laptop. So right now there is a USB-C, a USB-A, HDMI, DisplayPort, 
MicroSD, there is also an Ethernet that is coming very soon, and also an expanded storage. To decide what expansion cards people want to see, they're going to be doing polls over on their forums, so the latest one was to get a gigabit Ethernet, but as we can see there are things like high fidelity audio output, full size SD card rather than just MicroSD, and Arduino compatible microcontroller because I don't know, that sounds funny, a mini display port, LED matrix, and VGA, but there are plenty of other things that you could put on there if you really wanted to. They will also be sharing a reference design for these expansion cards, as well as opening up the specs, so anyone who wants to go and design one can absolutely go and do so. Now, to support these community developments, they're also going to be making it so inside of that marketplace, they will have a third-party marketplace for these expansion cards, allowing people to actually make money from their designs. Now, if I'm being completely honest, I think these expansion cards are absolutely amazing for marketing. They are an absolutely amazing marketing gimmick to hype people up who have no idea how these actually work, because look at the port on this. This port might look a little bit familiar. Let's look at it from another angle. What does this look like? It looks like USB-C. Do you know why it looks like USB-C? Because it is USB-C. So if we go into the purchasing section, if we go to the section on do I need a USB-C expansion card to charge the Framework laptop. The Framework laptop charges over USB-C from any of the four expansion card bays. So in the case of this USB-C card, this is effectively the world's shortest USB-C extension cable in the form of a little box or the USB-A card is a USB-C to USB-A adapter, and both of those are $9. The DisplayPort card is $19, HDMI $19, microSD $19 as well. So all of the port expansion cards are basically just really overpriced adapters that are built into the device. And the exact same is going to apply to every single expansion card that comes out in the future. They are literally just USB-C adapters, so if you just buy the device without any expansion cards, it's the exact same thing as having four USB-C expansion cards. And I don't see any of the articles about Framework actually calling this out. All of them are basically just puff pieces being like, hey, Framework is great, and yeah, the right to repair stuff is absolutely amazing, but this part here... I don't see why it's a part of the device, except to make itself stand out on the market. Because there are two very obvious problems with the expansion system. Firstly, these expansion cards take up a ton of space in the device. Have you ever seen a laptop that spaces its ports this far apart? The answer is no, because they don't need to. The reason why they're so far apart is to accommodate the adapter inside this little box. Space that could be used to have better fans or maybe have a discrete GPU, because right now it's just using Iris graphics, which for a 13 and a half inch laptop is perfectly fine, but I would like a discrete GPU or it could have, say, bigger speakers. All these things would actively make the device a better device. Also, all it's doing is adding in an extra point of failure. So on a regular device, you have to just worry about the port on the outside of the device breaking, and when that breaks, it's a pretty big deal, but it's still only one place. In this case, though, the port on the outside can break, but also the port on the inside. Why why do this? I don't see any benefit from this. Honestly, if I was running this company, I would just put four USB-C ports on it and then just put other ports on it as well. So there have been a lot of people saying, hey, I really want Ethernet. Why don't you just make Ethernet a standard port on the device? But their solution is no. Ethernet is going to be with the expansion card system. Why? If so many people want it, just put it on the device. The problem is you wouldn't exactly be able to with this system because the device is one of those like tapering devices and the only place the ethernet port would fit is where these cards are right here. Now I did mention a discrete GPU, however over on the forum the devs have said that they have tested it with some eGPU enclosures and everyone they've tested it with has worked perfectly fine because it's USB-C, and that's just how USB-C works. So you can still use a discrete GPU, you just have to go and buy an enclosure as well, which if you're the sort of person who cares about eGPUs, you probably already have an enclosure. On a future edition of this laptop, I would also like to see an AMD SKU, because right now, sure, the Intel chips aren't 
bad, but AMD is, is just better. That's just how it is. I'm not an AMD fanboy, but the AMD chips are just the better chips right now, especially on the mobile side. Because of all this focus on being able to rebuild and repair the device, they decided, hey, let's have a regular laptop SKU where this will all just be pre-built for you, but let's not be boring. Let's also sell a DIY edition as well, where we don't construct it. You can just go and build the laptop yourself. Which I think is a really, really cool experience if you care about how the device is actually working. Personally, I would just buy a pre-built laptop. But one of the benefits you do get of this is you can decide, hey, I don't want RAM, I don't want storage, I don't want a Wi-Fi card, I don't want an OS, I don't want a charger, because I already have these things laying around. And that allows you to actually save some money. However, what if you don't have those things laying around? What if you actually do need RAM, storage, Wi-Fi, a copy of Windows, and a charger? Well, what if I told you... <laughs> I had to double check this. What if I told you that the base model is $106 more expensive? So, it is $1,105 with the exact same configuration as the pre-built version. The pre-built version is $999. Why is the pre-built one cheaper? How is it that when you don't put labor costs in there, your device is more expensive. Now, I do get that you do have to like package the parts separately and make sure they don't get damaged. That does not cost $106. I want to know what the deal is here. Is this just expecting that no one was going to check this and we could just slither by making a little bit of extra money on the DIY side? Is this just a perfectly valid mistake and there's something wrong with the pricing? I want to know what the deal is here. Also, I have asked them on Twitter if there'll be an option to buy the pre-built version without an OS and without a charger because I would prefer to buy that and actually save a bit of money, but I really don't need a copy of Windows. I'm just going to stick Arch on it. And they've said right now, the DIY edition is designed to be really easy to build. So they're not planning to do that, but depending on the sort of feedback they get, they may consider it in the future. Because this is a Linux channel, you're probably wondering about Linux support. So while the device isn't going to be shipping with Linux, like say the XPS 13 Developer Edition, they have tested various distros in-house, and from their experience, they've all been working as you'd expect them to work. And they will also be publishing guides on how to get those distros installed on the laptop, but really that's just going to be a regular install guide. Now, one thing to ensure Linux will actually be working is they have actually been sending out pre-production units to maintainers of distros. And so far, what I've seen is Elementary and also CentOS have decided to jump in on this. I don't know if any other distros have, if they've like DM'd them personally outside of this, but they want to make sure Linux works on this device. On that note though, someone did actually ask about core booting. Now, I don't know anything about core boot myself, but from what I understand, Intel Boot Guard basically makes it impossible to modify the firmware. Right now, Boot Guard is going to be enabled from the factory, but they are considering releasing a SKU in the future that doesn't have this enabled. The reason why they're doing all of this is because they think the consumer electronics industry is completely broken. There is a massive, massive e-waste problem caused by the fact that most people cannot repair their devices. So if you buy something like an iPhone, sure, maybe like a couple of little things a repair shop can actually do, but every new generation, the device is becoming more and more locked down, where your only real option is to chuck the device or send it to the manufacturer, pay an exorbitant fee, where you're probably better off just chucking the device anyway and buying a new one. If you can't understand why this is such a problem, imagine if the automotive industry worked the same way, where if you say, replaced your tire, well now your brakes don't work. This is basically what we have with the consumer electronics industry. And it's not just from companies like Apple or Dell, it's everyone, it's Lenovo, it's HP, it's anyone you can possibly think of. Every single new generation of devices are becoming harder and harder to repair. While this is a very, very ambitious project, it's ambitious in a way that's actually achievable. It's not like they're trying to completely revolutionize the industry, come up with some new proprietary solution to make everything just work nicely together. No, they're just not soldering the board together and they're selling you parts. 
That's all you really need to do. I really, really hope this does well and shows companies that you still can make money on advice, even if you're not charging people insane amounts of money to repair it. Selling parts is still a way you can have ongoing income for a device you've already sold. If you really care about right to repair, then vote with your wallet. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Logan, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Carl, Will, Brennan, Chica, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Josh, Mitchell, Peter, D, Steven, Tees, Thuru, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to support work, them links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave pay, all that sort of stuff. If you want to watch my content on a platform that isn't YouTube, it is over on Odyssey. I've got a podcast as well called Tech Over T and a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I play video games like twice a week over on YouTube and Twitch. So I think that's everything for me and I'm out.